Hey guys, what's up? It's the Culture Detective here in uh, investigating your favorite things and uh, this is going to be a special video. Uh, right now it is March 7th and I have 21 days left until uh, the DSEs which is uh, incredibly um, stressing. So um, I'm going to make videos like this not only for me, you know, to help myself remember stuff to give myself motivation to do revision but also um, if you want to just study some chemistry uh, or anything you can just watch one of these videos I mean it's it's not harmful um, but it's a really bullshit video basically all right basically I am going to talk about chemistry and uh, only the electives today and I'm going to wrap them up and um, yeah I'm going to just go through these two books very quickly talk about uh, uh, you know some um, important points and uh, by doing that I'm actually revising also um, there's a method uh, of revision where I basically pretend to teach people stuff because I'm trying to interpret these information into my own words. So, um, you know, I'm basically revising really efficiently. And along with the revision, I'm going to eat this thing. This little uh, s'mores bar. S'mores is basically chocolate, marshmallow, and biscuits, I think. And I can't, you can't find these in Hong Kong. I think this is from the USA. It's from Chicago, Illinois, um, but my grandma's friend bought this and gave it to us and uh, my grandma's friend is from Seattle. So I'm going to eat this while I talk about chemistry. So this is going to be a very, very, very long video and I'm not going to upload it immediately because I have other stuff to upload, but I will upload this eventually. So. Um, it's like a live stream. Uh, I'm gonna try to unedit this as much as possible. So there will be boring moments. There will be oops moments like this. And um, I'm just trying to eat the thing, man. I'm just trying to not be hungry. Trying not to be hungry. All right, here is how chemistry electives part work. So we have the syllabus, we have the core part of the syllabus, which is huge. And then we have a little bit elective, you know, elective parts. And we have four parts to actually three parts to choose from analytical chemistry, industrial chemistry, and um, material chemistry. And we need to choose two out of the three. And everybody knows that analytical and industrial are the easier two. So of course, everybody chose analytical and industrial, the teachers chose it for us. And uh, the easiest one is industrial, um, but it's still, you know, not that easy given that it's chemistry and chemistry is not my strong suit. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this thing. So we'll start off with analytical chemistry. Uh, harder, uh, th this is the harder one. All right, I don't have any space, but neither do I have any space in my own bedroom, so. I guess I'm going to do this. So uh, analytical chemistry, uh, analyze, analysis, s'mores. How am I even going to eat this? I'm, I, I don't want to use my hand because coronavirus. Mm. All right. Five chapters. Chapter one, detecting you know, an organic chemical species. This is relatively easier. Identify the cation in a sample. So we have a bunch of cations and anions, anions, cations, 
aluminum ion, ammonium, calcium, copper 2, iron 2, iron 3, lead 2, magnesium, potassium, sodium, zinc. And uh, uh, yeah, pretty cool. All right. For appearance, lead 2 oxide is yellow. Um, also, um, silver iodide, it's yellow too, or reddish yellow. And also hydrated um, iron 3 chloride has to be hydrated because I don't know if it's anhydrous then it's just it's just gonna look white you know like copper chloride if it's anhydrous it's just gonna look white but if you add a drop of water it's gonna turn blue and a copper 2 ion is my favorite ion of all time for no good reason because it's blue I love that color um, um so yeah there's that silver iodide Spe very specific how about other silver halides i guess it doesn't work all that well other types of silver halides um not that yellowy uh for green we got iron two salts they're all pale green uh copper two chloride yes it's greenish blue um and the copper two carbonate is also green that's why i love copper two ions man all right solubility in water you can test ions for their uh, solubility by trying to dissolve them in water i have a solubility table uh it's a big table but um you know in general all the carbonate all the salts uh that uh, all the sodium potassium and ammonium salts are pretty much soluble all nitrates are pretty much soluble all halides uh including chlorides bromides and iodides are pretty much soluble except for silver and lead uh with an exception of fluoride Carbonates and sulfites and sulfates are pretty much insoluble, except for, um, you know, sodium, potassium, ammonium. All right, flame test. This is easy. First thing we've ever learned. Potassium, if you burn potassium, lilac, purple. Burn sodium, golden, yellow. Burn calcium, brick red. Burn copper, you got bluish green. And now we have the, um, the sublimate. If, um... If you heat any ammonium halide and there's white sublimate, it, it has ammonium. It has ammonia. Color of the solid formed um, yellow and hot, white when cold, zinc oxide. Orange when hot, yellow when cold, lead 2 oxide. Reddish brown when hot, brown when cold, iron 3 oxide. Black solid from blue or green substance, copper 2 oxide. Why am I still doing this? I don't know. All right, adding excess sodium hydroxide to any types of ions. Uh, usually they will just dissolve other than three, aluminum, lead, and zinc. Uh, they will, uh, blah, I'm stupid. Adding excess sodium hydroxide into any cations, white precipitate forms, or not exactly white, but you know, just precipitate forms. And, um, but for aluminum, lead, and zinc, they will redissolve. And if you, uh, and for excess ammonia, copper, silver, and zinc will redissolve. I have a slogan in mind already. That's basically the first chapter. Yay. All right. It's not over yet. What the hell? The test for ammonia. Um, add, uh, it turns moist red litmus paper blue. For to test carbon dioxide, sort of put them in some lime water. Lime water turns milky. To test for chlorine, um, put some moist blue litmus paper. It turns white as well. And sulfur dioxide. Uh, in a filter paper soaked with uh, oxidizing agents like uh, the potassium dichromate, it's going to turn green. If it's uh, purple uh, potassium permanganate, then it's going to turn uh, manganate. Uh, I don't know. All right, hydrochloric acid. Uh, 
hydrochloric acid reacts with carbonates to give out carbon dioxide and uh, hypochlorite plus hydrochloric acid will also turn moist blue litmus paper red and then bleach it turn it to, to white uh, barium sulfate is insoluble in hydrochloric acid. I know that this barium chloride is not soluble. Is that it? Is there still more? Jesus. Silver nitrate reacts with chlorine. Um, we get uh, silver chloride, which is a white precipitate. Uh, well, any chloride salt, actually. And for bromide, we got creamy precipitate. And for iodide, we got yellow precipitate. Mm. There we go. Is that chap That's chapter one. Finally, it's been eight minutes. Let me take a bite of that. End of my life. It's really good though. It's really good. Okay. Test for functional groups. Got it. We got a bunch of uh, functional groups. Alkenes. C, C, double bond. <clears throat> How to test for alkenes. <laughs> Damn. Um. Uh, add some bromine then you can decolorize the bromine from brown to colorless or you can oxidize it and make it and turn it into an alcohol or um, double alcohol you know now if you want to test for gosh damn <laughs> this thing's dry if you want to test for the alcohol um, oxidize it Right, oxidize. You can oxidize any alcohol, but if you, if you oxidize one degree alcohol, it turns into a a um, friggin uh, aldehyde. And if you oxidize an aldehyde, it, it becomes a carb um, a carboxylic acid. If you oxidize a second degree secondary alcohol okay so first degree alcohol is basically oh and then a bunch of stuff in the back a bunch of carbon and hydrogen second degree is that the um the oh is not exactly at the end and then for third degree is that it is in here and then there's another branch so it's three chains of carbon it's crazy and you can't oxidize uh, tertiary alcohol you can't do that shit um, iodoform test you can uh, use the iodoform, iodoform test uh, to test ketones uh, with a methyl group um, um, attached to a carbonyl group you can also test for alcohol I guess alright so I guess um, secondary alcohols and ethanol um, with a C, O, H, and then branch group will give a bright yellow precipitate of iodoform, aka triiodomethane, CHI3. Uh, yellow precipitate, uh, blah, blah, blah. Wow, all right. Lucas reagent, basically alcohol plus concentrated hydrochloric acid and zinc chloride very specifically you'll get um, a very specific chloride uh, basically cloudiness appears in one minute uh, if um, it's a tertiary alcohol and uh, for a primary alcohol it takes hours and it takes five minutes of a, if it's a secondary alcohol so there's that now if you want to test for aldehydes and ketones 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, aka 2,4-DNPH, and um, 
if um, it reacts with ketones or aldehydes, it becomes um, uh, it uh, orange precipitate will come out, and it, it depends. The orange precipitate uh, is a two four dinitrophenyl hydrazone if it's a ketone, uh, aldehyde benzaldehyde two four dinitrophenyl hydras. Okay, I I what the hell? Uh, next next page. <laughs> Toilet's reagents, silver mirror. Mm, ah, I love this test. Um, no, two four dinitro. That's my favorite test. Uh, but Toilet's reagent it reacts with aldehyde specifically to give off a silver mirror. And that Toilet's reagent is um silver ammonia. Yeah, with some hydroxide ions, because why not? And that silver mirror, it's actually silver. And then we also got iodoform tests, which works on ketones. And that's basically it. It also works on aldehydes, apparently. Hmm. All right, and then, you know, of course, if you got, if you want to test for an ester, just smell it, it tastes fruity delicious actually it doesn't taste fruity you know i'm wondering if i'm missing on anything like how should i test amines or amides i don't know next okay someone's at my house now we'll go to the second half of the second chapter separations and purifications of compounds first of all to separate stuff you can do distillation. For that, um, you need to um, get a get a flask, a distillation flask, thermometer, and the tube, the stem of the flask will sort of extend. And there's a condenser with water going in and out. And there's a receive adapter to another conical flask, and it will drop there. You need um, an oil bath, heat. Antibum and granules. The oil bath is not necessary though, because you know oil bath makes it, you know, hotter, faster, uh, without any heat loss. Okay, venue change. Uh, cause um, why not? Uh, let's continue with uh, analytical chemistry. Americans should also watch this, because they should know. What the hell are we studying here? End my life. All right. Hey, hey, okay. Where was I? Liquid, liquid extraction. All right, you can just stop moving. All right, uh, I talked about distillation. I haven't talked about chromatography. God damn, I love chromatography. I hate chromatography. <laughs> All right, but we also got fractional distillation. Of course, you gotta, you need to get the flask, a fractionating column, some glass beads in the middle, or some fractional sliding blade, whatever's tube condenser, Liebig condenser, and then recept receptive adapter, conical flask, distillate, and a thermometer, so that the whole thing doesn't just explode. ABG should be applied as well. And then we have the liquid-liquid extraction, which is also incredibly important. Liquid-liquid extraction. I'm a little confused on this because I don't know how to separate these two layers. Say you got a benzone. All right, say you add, you say there's a mixture a mixture of um of organic and um aqueous compounds i have i still have no idea what's going on during the extraction place the aqueous solution containing the product in a separating funnel so first of all you place the solution containing the product. So you want to separate two kinds of things. So the mixture into the separating funnel. 
then add an organic solvent that is immiscible with water, such as ethoxyethane. But it doesn't have to be ethoxyethane. I mean, it could be uh, any organic solvent that is immiscible with water. And then, upon shaking the liquid mixture in the separating funnel, the product will dissolve preferentially in the organic solvent. So one, only one kind of product will dissolve in the organic solvent. But the other kind, the aqueous kind, will not dissolve in it. Hold the stopper and tap firmly when shaking the separating funnel. After shaking, allow the two layers to separate and run off the lower aqueous layer because there is pressure built up because gas is released. We can re-extract the aqueous layer using fresh samples of ethoxyethane solvent so as to obtain more of the product. Why not? The final stage of the process involves the following steps. Collect together the different samples of ethoxyethane, remove or, or any organic solvent, remove the final traces of water using a drying agent such as anhydrous sodium sulfate, filter off the drying agent, Obtain the product by distilling off the ethoxyethane solvent or any organic solvent. Again, um, dry the results. Okay, this is better. Dry the results in organic layer with anhydrous magnesium sulfate. Seems to be a better idea. Then filter out the solid, get the filtrate, distill off, get pure. Ta da. I'm still a little confused, but um, I'll. It's, it's going to come up to me at some point. Recrystallization is uh, to purify crude, very crude, solid products. Now, how do you do that? Now, we have a flask, solid product dissolved in a very hot solvent. Now, we want the solid product. And, and there's a glass rod. You pour that and it drops, slides down the glass rod into a fluted filter funnel, stemless, stemless funnel. And... Also, a fluted filter paper, so that the filter, the color of the filter paper, it's oh, fluted, so it's the way it's folded, it's weird, and the color of the filter paper needs to be different from that of uh, the solvent, and so the residue will be in the filter paper while everything will drop down into another beaker, and it's the filter, allowing the crystals to form and collecting the crystals by filtration under reduced pressure. Use a Butchner flask and funnel in the process. Put a piece of filter paper in the funnel and wet the paper using a small amount of solvent. Put the funnel in the flask and connect the rubber. Uh, I mean, you can do that. You can definitely do that. You know, vacuum the stuff out. But, I mean, it's an extra step. Okay, chromatography. Everybody loves chromatography. It's the best thing in the world. Uh, we may employ chromatography to separate a complex mixture of substances that cannot be separated by the recrystallization method readily. The basic principle of chromatography is that the components in the mixture have, a different, te have different tendencies to absorb onto a surface or dissolve into a solvent. There are several different types of chromatography, which uh, such as paper chromatography, column chromatography, thin layer chromatography, gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, high, high performance liquid chromatography, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but we're only going to check out paper chromatography first. In paper chromatography, the stationary phase is water, and in the paper fibers, um, while the mobile phase is a developing solvent. So I guess um, what's going on is that there's a beaker and the um, we have a watch glass for some reason. And the stationary phase, stationary phase is um, it's on the paper, so it's water. But then down there we have the developing solvent and we get the line, the starting point, which is marked with a graphite pen. And um, yeah, a solution of mixture to be separated, uh, sort of add a dot onto the paper and it sort of moves up and uh, it becomes a chromatogram. And um, we may spray a developing agent such as ninhydrin onto the paper uh, to, um, or, or iodine vapor to color the spots, but basically spots will appear on the 
like like this on the chromatogram. This is a weird pose. Um, and then we have the retention ratio, the distance Kumonin travels relative to the solvent is a constant as long as the experimental conditions are kept the same. The a distance um, relative to the solvent is called the retention ratio, distance traveled by component over the distance traveled by the solvent. <sighs> Give me a break. All right. Column chromatography. Uh, column chromatography is about the extraction of stuff. Uh, not really, I mean, yes, yeah, separation, but, you know, for extraction, while in paper chromatography, you're not really extracting jackass, you know. Um, so for column chromatography, it's almost like the paper chromatography, but upside down, meaning that the starting point is on top. We got the eloquent, which is the mobile phase, the sample mixture, and then it's just gonna just go down and, uh, you know, travels, farther it travels, the more soluble it is. And uh, so, yeah, the most soluble one comes out at the bottom. And then uh, we also have a so-called gas, a thin layer chromatography. It's similar to paper, except the stationary phase is a fine layer of alumina or silica gel, uh, not water. And that's it. Test for purity of a product. Blah! Um, determining the melting point of a solid product. Yes, we have an, an electrical melting point apparatus, which is really cool. We can also determine the boiling point, but we don't have an apparatus for that. So we need to do an experimental setup for that as well. We have the, oh yes, the, what the hell is this? Um, the circular flask, right? I don't know, but, um, you know, something like that. A guy, a man is tired. A man is tired. <laughs> Quantitative methods of analysis. Mm. Um, volumetric, we got an uh, analytical method. Filtering off the precipitate, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so gravimetric analysis. Um, it has something to do with precipitate. You can dry the precipitate by putting them in a desiccator. More like defecator. Oh... Okay, there are major sources of error, systematic error, such as uh, instrumental error, operative error, error of method, minimizing the error due to the loss of precipitate by producing a precipitate of sufficiently low solubility, because uh, if the precipitate is very soluble, then it shouldn't be a precipitate. Using a minimum amount of solvent to wash the precipitate, that is, uh, yeah, that's important as well. All right, Grav we got random error as well. Gravimetric determination of phosphorus content in a sample of fertilizer. Now we're talking. I hate this. Um, so step one, we need to prepare the sample solution. We accurately weight fertilizer in the distilled water. Then we put some magnesium sulfate. Hell yeah. Then the magnesium, and nope, add ammonia. That's also important. So now we have the sample solution, magnesium sulfate and ammonia. And then mix it and then filter the thing in uh, 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 Butchner, Butchner funnel with small holes in the porcelain disc, a clamp and suction pump. And it just filters off the precipitate. And then we have the precipitate in the Butchner funnel, wash it, allowing it to dry. And the precipitate is hydrous magnesium ammonium phosphate. Damn. And then from the weight of the precipitate, you can just figure out how much um phosphate ions how much hpo4 which is um phosphorus content whatever oh a guy is tired a man is tired calcium content on a sample solution first of all prepare the sample solution 
a dilute hydrochloric acid and methyl red indicator. Then precipitating the calcium oxalate because we're looking for calcium content in the sample solution. What does it have to do with oxalate? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what? Sample solution. Now we mix them all together. Dilute hydrochloric acid, ammonium oxalate, carbon monoxide ammonia solid compound, and methyl red indicator. Um, what the fuck? Calcium oxalate. Where the hell is it? calcium? Anyway, the hot reaction mixture. We put it in a centered glass filtering crucible. Suction pump. And then ice cold distilled water. And then we have the precipitate. And the precipitate is... Oh, wait. There's more. Uh, put it in uh, an oven with an aluminum foil cover. And then weighing it. And the precipitate should be... Calcium oxalate hydrous hydrous calcium oxalate. Huh. Calculating the term determining the concentration of chloride ions in seawater by precipitation titration. First of all, pipette 25 centimeters cube of seawater to a volumetric flask, dilute it. And because uh, it's salty, put some chromate indicator. Hell yeah, I love chromate indicator. What the hell is that? Add a little sodium hydrogen carbonate and, and the chromate indicator. Chromate indicator, which is um orange. So it's supposed to turn green, I guess. Run the standard AK solution of silver nitrate into the diluted seawater until a reddish Oh, so you put chromate indicator on the seawater and then you add some silver nitrate on top, hoping that silver chloride will form. But when it forms, All right, we done uh, a solution of potassium permanganate. Standardization of an aqueous solution of potassium permanganate. We need to figure out how m how many moles of potassium permanganate do we have in here. And uh, we have a known mass of uh, sodium oxalate dissolved in uh, dilute hydrosulfuric uh, acid. <laughs> okay, here's the equation. I need to memorize this. God damn, boy. Five. Hydrogen oxalate. Oxalic acid. Plus two. Manganate ions. Plus six. Hydrogen ions, we have 10 CO2, 2 Mn2 plus manganese, ion and 8 water. And then from the mass of, um, oh, and then, I'm confused. Mass of Na2C2O4, sodium oxalate. Now we know number of moles of um, oxalic acid reacted. And then we can find a uh, number of moles of potassium permanganate reacted. And then find the molarity. Goddamn. Determining the iron, ta iron content in the commercial iron tablets. Uh, by... Um, Reacting permanganate with iron, uh, which gives off um, Fe3+, plus, uh, iron 3 ions. I don't know what's going on anymore.
a man is sleepy. Grind two iron tablets. Soak the powder in 50 centimeters cube of dilute sulfuric acid. Make a pretty solution. Transfer the solution into a conical flask. Titrate it. Water. Uh, permanganate. I, I need to revise this permanganate index. Fucking shit. Like, this is complicated. Okay, can we just skip? Calculating the concentration of sodium hypochlorite in bleach. Determining the vitamin C content in the in, in, in grape juice. This is getting out of hand. Alright. Okay, here are the easier easier ones. Colorimetry. Um infrared spectrum mass spectrometry. Alright, so I don't have much I don't have too much time left. It's like 1.30 p.m. now, almost. And I still need to finish up this one. Chemistry. Industrial chemistry electives. And it's going to be quicker, because I don't, I, I'm running out of storage space and time. So, um, four chapters we got. Uh, we got the introduction, which shouldn't be called introduction, it should be called uh, rate of reactions. We got factors affecting the rate of a reaction and including catalysts and then we got a few industrial processes which we need to pay attention to and then at the end green chemistry which is also super duper important but not as important as the previous three chapters. Okay. God damn it. So um I guess, first of all, um, chemical industry um, converts raw materials found in the crust, ocean, and atmosphere into products of greater value to us. The raw materials include petroleum and coal, air, water, veggies, and uh, minerals. And uh, there are different types of, um, you know, stuff. Uh, products like basic inorganic chemicals and fertilizers, petrochemicals and polymers, dye stuffs. I I'm serious. It's it's really called dye stuffs. Pharmaceuticals specialties. All right. I don't think this is all that important. So we're just gonna skip. We're just gonna skip, skip, skippity hip. Now, rate of reaction. Now, here we go. First of all, this funny ass image. But second of all, this graph, uh, where you see the concentration of um, of a um, of, of a specific reactant just going down um, as time goes by. So you can see the uh, rate of reaction sort of changing, and um, yeah. And then, now, if you plot the graph of the y-axis being rate of reaction and the x-axis being the concentration of a reactant, then you have a special graph that you very much need. This one. And by looking at this graph, you can tell that, um, you can tell that this reaction, um, the rate of reaction, uh, the frick, uh, whoa, whoa, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to say? The order of reaction with respect to um, this reactant is one. So zero order reactions, it's basically a straight line like this. And first order is like this. Second order is like this, in that you know it's sort of going up like a parabola, and um, yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much it. And then we have the uh, react uh, rate constant, which is also super duper important because the rate of reaction equals to rate constant times. Uh, reactant A and uh, its number of um, D 
the number of moles of reactant A and reactant B and the number of moles and, and so on and so forth. And um, by, well, not really a number of moles, but um, the order of reaction on the top to the power of. So there's that. And um, I think that's all you guys need to know. If, you do, if you're doing experiments like this, like this one, sulfur, um, forming sulfur by thiosulfate and um, uh, hydrochlor uh, sulfuric acid, then the initial rate of reaction should be proportional to the uh, 1 over time to reach the opaque stage, uh, which means uh, uh, the, uh, the initial rate should be inversely proportional to time. And um, there we go, chapter 1. Uh, I told you it's going to be quick, it's going to be quick. Now, chapter 2, factors affecting the rate of reaction. Um, first of all, temperature will definitely affect it. The kinetic energy, the average, average kinetic energy of particles increase. The number of effective collisions increase, so the rate of reactions increase. Uh, we have the collision theory, and we have the energy profile, because right here, we've got some potential energy. Down here is the reaction coordinate, and it sort of goes up and then goes down. If it goes down... At the end, it's exothermic. If it goes up at the end, it's endothermic. Uh, but basically, there's that. And but usually it goes up first and then it goes down. You know because we have an activated complex, and um, usually the whole thing from the reactant to the activated complex, the whole thing is the activation energy. And then as it go down, the net uh, potential energy would be the enthalpy change of the reaction. And then we got the energy distribution curve, just like this, also known as the uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, where the y-axis is the number of molecules with kinetic energy and the x-axis being kinetic energy. And the area under the graph is the number of molecules, so, you know, they always stay constant. Um, if it's hotter, then, you know, the... Um, Number of moles with kinetic energy uh, will be higher at the end, um, but um, it, it won't go up that quickly, apparently. Oh, more, well, more like more kinetic, more molecules have kinetic energy. That's what's up. And uh, we got the um, we got uh, reactions, chemical reactions that require more than one steps. More than one step. We got intermediates, and we also got a bunch of catalysts that we should really pay attention to. All right, this is getting crazy. All right, we got homo uh, homogeneous catalysts. Okay, wait. Uh, catalysts can be poisoned so that that they can no longer function properly. Goddamn. In heterogeneous catalysts, the poison molecules are absorbed more strongly onto the catalyst surface than the reactant molecules, and the catalyst becomes inactive. Damn, that's dangerous. We also got some catalytic converters, and apparently the the um um the catalysts include rhodium and platinum. So there's that star platinum. You know, I just yeah, uh, heterogeneous catalysts. This, like this, basically in stage A, the nitrogen and atom molecule, uh, hydrogen molecules, they sort of stick to the iron and then they get absorbed by the iron and then they reconnected, they got, they reconnected by the iron and they deabsorbed by the iron, the iron. So there's that. <clears throat> hmm, for homogeneous catalysts. A catalysis, um, we, uh, reactant and catalysts are dispersed in a single phase, usually a liquid, as in uh, 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 so, um, I guess there's that. I gotta look more into this though. Enzyme catalysts. Uh, we got different enzymes that can act as catalysts. We all know that. All right. Fuck. Stop 
turning over. Jeez. All right, so you know how to make, uh, you know how to make wine. Well, first of all, we got this jar. We have yeast underneath, bubbles coming up, and basically a mixture of grapes and water. And the grapes and water they sort of undergo reaction with the uh, enzyme and uh, well, uh, with the uh, catalysis of the enzymes and the yeast and. Uh, um, Glucose, uh, glucose sort of um, reacts, and uh, the yeast has an enzyme which breaks down glucose to ethanol and carbon dioxide, so that's how it works. And um, we got a device X, which is this little weird ball pump thing to prevent air from entering. Otherwise, ethanol will be oxidized, also prevent pressure from building, and to um, increase ethanol concentration of wine, fractional distillation will do the job. That's why it's alcohol, because it has ethanol. Alright, we got the industrial processes. Three industrial processes. First of all, we got the uh, fertilizers, the NPK fertilizers, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's some uh, reaction conditions that I need to uh, put more effort into. And then there is the, um, the, uh, electrolysis of brine. We have a few setups to do brine, and uh, we also have the um, the other process that is the the methanol synthesis. I think basically, um, yep. You know, it involves a bunch of equations, but basically, you can create methanol by just putting CO two and H two in and okay anyways green chemistry here we go so green chemistry is um not much to know other than atom economy where uh you sort of calculate uh, how much of the percentage of products are actually uh, uh usable and uh the, uh the more the better of course and that's pretty much all you need to know in green chemistry there are also a bunch of Processes, processes, um, Monsanto processes um, to create ethanol, uh, ethanoic acid stuffs. Yeah, basically there's that. So uh, it's finished. All right, all right, Jesus.